Filipino Americans are significant enough to have a seat at the table. And Anthony also said, if you're not at the table, we're going to have you for lunch. So the purpose of this panel is, how do we get to the table? What are the, what are the struggles of getting to the chair at the table? And what can we do in our, in our own communities? So I'm just going to introduce you real quick. First of all, we have uh, Geraldine Alcid representing the Philippine Advocates for Justice. She's the executive director. Yay. And Dalton Burkett, you know, really good friend of mine from the South Bay, founder of Lead Filipino. We have Roderick, that was Macwall, which also happens to be my cousin's name. Uh, he is currently the director of program development at PEP, the Pinoy, uh, Pinoy Education Partnerships. And finally, finally, we have Arvin Garcia, who is the, currently the external co-chair of NC PASA, the Northern California Philippine X American Student Alliance. And finally, we have Mario Demira, the community development manager of Zoma Philippines. So moving on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the purpose of this forum is to how do we engage in engagement for <coughs> oftentimes millennials who are credit for we killed off Applebee's, right? Or oh we're not we killed off Toys R Us. So what's something that we can fix, something that we can do better by improving civic engagement? And uh, also talk about the role we have in the organization, how do you how do you work on improving civic engagement? So we'll start off from that. Thank you very much. First of all, full disclosure, I'm not a lady. <laughs> Gen X probably was right. <laughs> That's right, millennial at heart. But um, thank you very much. My name is Geraldine Alcid. I'm the Executive Director of Filipino Advocates for Justice. Salamat po sa inyo sa pagkikita sa akin ngayon. And I do want to thank um, NAFA for convening this, this panel and for the Consulate General for uh, making the space to address civic engagement. It's so important right now. It's not a secret. We are um, living through unprecedented levels of crazy with an anti-immigrant, an anti-woman, an anti-LGBTQ, an anti-climate, uh, climate, anti-truth administration with questionable legitimacy, but I'll stop there because I can go on forever. However, we also have been seeing an awe-inspiring response of people coming out and um, being engaged nationally. Just take a look at all the women who are currently running for office. So for Filipino Advocates for Justice, it's been a very busy year of uh, fighting back while we also grow our capacity to fight back, um, kind of like driving the car or, yeah, driving the car while we're building it. Um, but FAJ is actually a 45-year-old organization. We're based in Oakland and Union City. We were originally founded um, in response to the discrimination Filipinos were facing post-1965 Immigration Act when we were coming in, um, in in great numbers. FAJ, what we do, we offer a blend of direct services and organizing and advocacy. The people that we meet, they normally really come to us for um, assistance with, uh, for free naturalization assistance, or uh, they're looking for help with a wage theft claim, or young people who are looking to um, engage in our prevention or in our leadership, uh, leadership development programs. And by the end, for the most part, is, is very much a guiding principle uh, and value of our work. Um, but to really more accurately describe FAJ and what we do, it's really equal parts of Bayanian and Makibaka. <laughs> um, we serve and represent those who are most vulnerable in our community who have been shut out of the political process and really have had little or no say in the decision making um, of policies that harms them, harms their families, harms their neighborhoods, and harms their communities. And our services and programs, they serve the youth, newly arrived immigrants, low-wage workers, and families, all often overlooked because they are either unable or ineligible to vote. Um, so we work with middle school, high school youth, young adults, tenants, K-12 
caregivers, and what we do is we enable them to see themselves as leaders of the community with ability to help them change. My name is um, Roderick Das Mengual. I'm the uh, Director of Program Development for the Pinoy Pinoy Educational Partnerships. Um, I guess I want to start off with this first. Dang, this is beautiful. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when they say, like, um, Philippines is, is, a, is a very, very poor country, but dang, are we wealthy in such culture and such power right here. To be, to have, like, a movement right here, to have folks that are elders, to young folks, to college students, people aspiring to do politics, this is powerful. So um, I hope this generates some sort of energy moving forward. Um, with my organization, with PEP, we've been around for, man, 16, 17 years. Um, and basically our program is an education leadership pipeline where we teach teachers how to teach ethnic studies, specifically of Filipino-American um, experiences. And one thing about, we're talking about civic engagement. Of course, we can, the, one of the reasons why we started PEP was because there was a shortage of teachers that look like us, right? Ruby Barra got that song, Us, right? And it was about, we didn't have representation in those things. We didn't have representation in history books. So what we had to do was we had to do it our own damn self, right? We have this one quote we always talk about, Ante Alison or Alison Tintiampovanas, who's the founder of Pep, said, we grow our own hope, right? If we can't rely on society to do it for us, then we got to do it on our own. It's about self-determination. I've got my family from SF State right there with the birthplace of the World Liberation Front, ethnic studies. And we one thing that we learned is we have to grow our own hope. Right? We're the only college of ethnic or school of ethnic studies. And what makes a movement is not something that's just sectors, but it's a movement where we can go trans um, generational, and that's what we do, right? We teach teachers how to teach Philippine American studies from kindergarten all the way through college. And then as myself, as an instructor at Skyline College, the combined learning community, that is the biggest challenge. Is I see students that are from straight out of high school to a Lola in my, my, my class. So how do I build the bridges? It's our commonality of experiences, but we have to grow our own hope. Um, and part of that hope, um, Assemblyman Vanta talked about history. History is our power, right? And when my, in my dissertation, I wrote about like, man, history is power, okay? And I used to watch this, this show called Heroes. Anybody watch Heroes back in the day? Nobody knows. Okay, Google it. All right. And in the beginning, they were like, you know, uh, save the world, save the cheerleader. And then one of the other quotes was like, if you don't use your powers for good, then you're not a hero. If history is power, then that's our superpower. We are informed by the histories of our struggles of our people, and that's responsibility. Right? That's our bloodline. That's that's what Kendrick says. That's our DNA. Okay, so how do we use that DNA to invoke and inform the youth to get to change the world? So I think that's one way to get civically engaged. Just history is power. Grow our own. Life. Uh, hi everyone. It's quite wonderful. Uh, he, he quoted Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. Um, I was gonna quote you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mario Camara. I'm with Soma Filipinas. Soma Filipinas is the cultural heritage district in the South of Market neighborhood. Uh, just down the street, you can come visit the neighborhood. South of Market um, is, uh, you know, is one of the largest Filipino neighborhoods here in San Francisco. It's the second largest of the Excelsior. And uh, I'm the community development uh, coordinator and manager. Um, and Soma Filipinas was founded uh, last year. We were designated by the city and state, I'm sorry, 2016, by the city of San Francisco and by the state of California, recognized as the cultural heritage district. And how many folks know about Soma, South of the Market, right? Many of you. Uh, because the Soma for our community here in San Francisco and, and also the Bay Area has been an entry point for so many of our community members. Um, that long history, Filipinos have been in the South Market for decades. Um, Families have always uh, moved there because of the affordable housing historically that was there for many of the manufacturing work that was there. Um, and it was an entry point for a lot of our families to come and get established because we support each other when we migrate from the homeland. And it was a place where many families would get on their feet and be able to uh, you know, move on to other places. But because of the hyper-gentrification 
gentrification and displacement that our city is experiencing, because the South Bend market is right on the border of the financial district. Um, you know, we look at San Francisco as the front line of gentrification in the United States. It's often looked that way. But the South the market is the front line of that gentrification. And so, Soma Filipinas is really a strategy to preserve the community that exists. But not in a, uh, in a mere manner of just being plaques or, you know, uh, recognizing our history, but to propagate and continue and preserve that community. And our strategies are really rooted in three kind of main things. Uh, one is uh, propagating and uh, proliferating our culture our arts, our music, our language. Uh, our second strategy is around land use and affordable housing and being engaged with developers, being engaged with the city departments, with the you know, with local government on how we can maximize and create more true affordable housing for our residents. And then our third strategy is around workforce and economic development. So creating good, well-paying jobs for our community members. Uh, supporting small local businesses that have been there for generations and new and aspiring businesses, young uh, and new entrepreneurs that come and be in the district to really uh, have a vital um, and robust community. But all of those things, all those strategies are really rooted in social justice. And I re you know, was really inspired by seeing the uh, Rob Bonta's story and, and I, and I kind of want to maintain that theme because for some of Filipinas that believes our strategies to, is to be rooted in social justice principles. And how we engage with the community is really through education, through collaboration, through partnership with other organizations uh, in the neighborhood uh, to really find the unities and how to push forward to maximize the community. We should not be pushed out of San Francisco. Um, the community has been reduced by 50%. There used to be 5,000 Filipinos in the South of Market. After 2010 census, it was down to 2,500, right? And so uh, we see this trend. We have a history. Our manongs, our manangs, everyone has a strong stake and roots in San Francisco. We built the city just as the Irish, just as the Chinese, and many other immigrant groups. And we deserve to be here and stay. So that's one of our main goals. with Lee Filipino, and I want to give a shout out to, to Jason and Quinn and Kevin and the whole NAPA team for really putting on such an amazing event. So I'm here and I'm carrying the flag for San Jose. Who here is from San Jose besides me and Kevin? Hey! Hey! hey. Awesome. So Lee Filipino, we are a volunteer-run organization based in San Jose, and we are a baby. We were founded by me uh, in 2015, and the goal and the heart of the organization, we work with college students, uh, young adults, and families, all in San Jose and the other 14 um, cities down in Santa Clara County to really involve and engage Filipinos and Filipinas all around the civic leadership and public service piece. So um, it's something that's super near and dear to me. Uh, with Santa Clara County having the fourth largest Filipino and Filipina um, population um, in the state of California, I felt that there needed to be something around activating and sparking these conversations. And this table that we talk about in the abstract, right? We need a seat at this table, more Filipinos and Filipinas need to run for office, appointed positions. I didn't know what this table was. It was super abstract to me. And so, back. When I finished, I went to San Jose State, and I knew that I had about two career paths that I wanted to go down. I wanted to start a nonprofit organization, and I wanted to tie in the whole civic piece. So that's what I did. Uh, Lead Filipino, I'm shy sometimes to take any type of uh, credit for starting the organization because it has really been lifted and elevated and cultivated by a shared belief of folks down in our community, including students like Kevin, um, our moderator on this panel, Ian sitting in the back, and really just being a bulwark for our community and really addressing the need around the civic engagement piece. So when we think about our community and we zoom out, we look macro, meso, and micro, the theme and the spirit of Filipinos being underrepresented across all sectors and industries is something we hear time in memorial. So at the heart of Leave Filipino, we wanted to address that. So you see it coming through our programs. We focus on 
um, empowering our women and girls. And I got to shout out uh, Gina Marie Rosales over there. She's one of our flag high mentors. Hey. So we work with um, women and girls through our flag high program that's every spring. We uh, bring in uh, college students, community college girls, um, high schoolers to come down to San Jose and we pair them with mentors. So Panay's, leading Panay's, uh, working across all sectors and industries. So that's our work with women and girls. We have our whole civic engagement piece, which is um, really put out through a collaborative effort with other grassroots um, South Bay based organizations called the Boto Filipino. We work with Hawis um, on our buy in Silicon Valley and the Asian Law Alliance, among uh, many other groups down there. And so I'm going to just pause and focus on the civic engagement work. So, how are we trying to define what this table is? We really show these young folks and these students exactly the steps to take to get appointed to a commission. So we host trainings on, and we bring commissioners in. One of our advisors, we're blessed to have her guidance, is the chair for the Santa Clara County Commission on the Status of Women. So we brought her in to lead a training last spring, along with Wendy Ho, who is uh, one of the first elected Panayas down in Santa Clara County. She's the president of, uh, she's the president of the San Jose Evergreen Community College District. So yeah, that's a mouthful. But, Really showing these pathways, right? What does it take to get appointed to a commission? What does running for office look like? Um, serving on a nonprofit board, but also to, to tack on to many of the themes that you'll hear here, that you will hear today around really centering all of that in, in ethnic studies and understanding our Filipino and Filipina history. Um, that being our touchstone. So the identity piece, our culture, our traditions, our customs being treasured and being preserved. So you see that taught in our different programs, really reinforced. And then we ask our students and challenge them to take what they know and pivot. So if you want to run for elected office or civic engagement is something you want to breathe life into with your own personal touch, being versed in issues that are impacting people across all communities and all neighborhoods. So we're talking we talk to our students about transportation issues, traffic and congestion, housing, energy and the environment, health, K through 12 education, human rights, social justice, the whole gamut of what enacting public policy means. So we have these conversations around what is policy? What does that mean in the tie of being a Panora Panay and then being in the civic leadership space? So really taking it from the abstract and bringing it to the personal touch. A lot of people don't get involved in advocacy or they shy away from the word activism because it's seen as something that could be dicey or controversial or unstable or it's disrupting. But a lot of people don't get involved in civic issues until it touches them in a very meaningful and deep way. So when you talk about the human rights issue, uh, workers being exploited, being priced out of here because of urban renewal and development that has happened for years on end, or sitting in traffic, whether or not it's a quality of life thing or it's a survival thing, people are attracted to the issues when it touches them in a personal way. So that's why we really dip into our identity. What does it look like in terms of transcendence for our Filipino and Filipina community? And we tie it back to being a leader, being vocal, and being in the civic space. Hi, I'm Arvin. Um, I'm from Antipasa. Um, so, Antipasa, um, actually, before I start, I just want to thank Jason and just inviting us to have a seat at the table, too, because we, we were just founded like end of last year. So, we just chartered as an organization. Like, we're like an infant. We're like, we just, we just you know, came out and young. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, but as you pass up what we are, um, we, we are the encompassment of the student community among the collegiate level. Um, kind of came together to have this space where we can dialogue what we can do for each other and what we can do for our community. Because um, as students, we do so much through having a whole load of classes running, um, you know, work part time, as well as you know, being leaders in our own uh, respective organizations as well. Uh, so we do, we came together, you know, to say, what can we do for each other? Like, you know, our time to be, 
I guess leaders is now, and uh, what can we do to come together and give resources together, as um, a lot of them were saying, um, a lot of second generations, um, college, uh, fill in college students, go through college, they join these organizations, they put so much and pour out so much. Um, so our organization is um, kind of us all coming together and say, seeing what we can do as a community, as a collegiate community, and how can we have our own seat at the table as students, whether it be civically engaged or some social rights issue that we all agree on, uh, whether it be in our own education systems that may not support our organization or our own student bodies and don't understand our experiences as Filipino Americans, or some other type of issue that we can have this um, network and support. So that's, that's what DPAS is, the gist of it, um, how we can come together uh, as an alliance. But we are deeply rooted for our mission statements in both the history that we learned in our own uh, ethnic studies classes at our respective universities, which not all of them have. Uh, one of our own issues that we came together is to uh, support each other because not each university in Northern California supports their Philippine population. Um, so that's just the way we want. We came together so we can support one another as a community as well as what do we do after? Uh, after we graduate college. Uh, a lot of Filipino American students who graduate are kind of disillusioned after being involved with these organizations. If, if you've been to one of our shows like a PCN or been to a Friendship Games, we spent hours and hours on, on, on these, um, these organizations and what do we do after? So this is another issue that we're trying to come together as well as Sorry, I was going to point that but, um, yeah. So what, we do, what we're trying to do, since we're an organization, um, we're trying to come together to see and what we can do as a collective, um, having a seat at the table for um, everyone from our organization, because it, it, it's, it's hard like catering to such different demographics across Northern California, it's such an ambitious thing, but um, me and my co, Bradley over there, um, we just came together and we're doing this, you know. So it, it's just kind of a huge positive signal for us, like graduating college and seeing what are we going to do now and am I actually, can I actually become a leader? Um, but that's what we try to do. Man. Yeah, so pertaining to the question of how are we, we going to be civically engaged our own millennial population, uh, we yeah, like as we grow up in a generation that we we just see all these headlines, these news articles, these politically charged statements, and our own reaction was formation of this organization of what can we do um, instead of just being college students just sitting in the background. What can we do to express our voices and show that you know we're not just students, but we're we're not just the students of tomorrow, but we can be the students of today if we actually go for it. We actually. You know, have an aim for some type of cloud that we can um, show that we exist and our opinions exist. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Philippine American population is now four million strong, and many people don't know that nearly one fourth or one million of these uh, Philippine Americans are actually between the ages of 18 and 34, so around college age or, or young adults. And just as a show of hands, uh, who here is a college student? Do I have my CSU East folks? CSU East Bay folks? Hey. SFJ hey. folks? Hey. 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 So um, one of the challenges that we have that Arvid mentioned was it's, it's very difficult to get Filipino American youth um, into this mode of being civically engaged. What are the major issues that Filipino American youth Base and what do your organizations do to uh, overcome them and get involved? Yeah. Starting, um, we'll start with Arvin. Um, I guess my generation is uh, we're, we're really becoming vocal. Um, we definitely um, take the fruits of you know, the past years. 
I'm, I'm, honored, I'm honored to be on the same panel with. Like we take the fruits of that, also as well as the fruits of you know uh, <coughs> Manta and the legacy that the Manans have you know just kind of laid down for us that we're following. So we're a generation that you know has strong opinions, but we just don't know how to always express them. What, are, what can we do for the community? What as students? Uh, my own experience of being disillusioned once I gra graduated a few months ago. What do I do when I'm here? And how can I express my own opinion in a way that both pivots me towards a career path I can live on, but as well as doing something I love and want to you know, create for people who come after me as well. So, um, yeah. it's definitely a challenge because we we just don't know. And that's what we try to provide. And, you know, um, as an organization that we're here, that you know, we're all coming together and we're dialing right, we're speaking right here and right now of what can we do uh, for a lot of these students. Because a lot of these students uh, that, like I remember organizations from Chico State, from Sonoma State, from um, Santa stuff, they don't always have um, communities or an administration that supports them. So that's one thing that we want to come together and, um, what can we do to support y'all, and what can we do to, you know, have our opinions expressed and have them on the table? Because you know, we 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 have so much we want to say, but it's sometimes it's just we, we need a space to say it as well. So. Eighteen to thirty-four is a is a wide range, so I am thankful for the charity to be considered a member of the youth still. So a lot happens from 18 to 34. We know that developmentally, um, life changes. Arvin here really um, spoke to when you're super involved and you're very active as a student leader on campus and you invest yourself and you give your time and your love and your energy to production such as PCN or a student government or some initiative that you lead and what does that look like after after you attain that degree and then you're chasing that American life, right? So what we did at Leap Look, you know, I mentioned our Fly Panay's work and this takes place every spring. It's a huge summit. We bring in 130 to 150 uh, college-age girls and Panay mentors. But part of this work, we don't just we don't just take guesses and spitball as we Filipino about the issues that our community cares about. We do our homework. And for the past two years, we've led focus groups. So we've gone to colleges in the South Bay, and we've also talked with our mentors. So Panay's that have really blazed the trails for us, that are on their way to retirement, that might be moms, that might be mid-career, to talk to them. We don't want, yes, Youth has a stronghold in our future that is uncontested, but we also want to create spaces where our moms and our aunties and our lolas also feel through their sacrifice and their strength that they are still part of this conversation. So it's all fly and I, we welcome everyone, but it's a day for the ladies and it's our program for all the ladies. So, <laughs> woo, ladies. So we did these focus groups and we talked with about 40 all together. We were at Cal State East Bay, our girls over there. Thanks for hosting us. Santa Clara University, of San Jose State, Stanford, and UC Santa Cruz. Yes, our touch was limited to the South Bay, but if you want to get in on our focus groups, holler at me because I'd love to talk to you if you're in Sacramento. I want to know what's going on in San Francisco. I want to know what's going on out in Vacaville. So, yes. The three issues that emerged out of these focus groups, we asked these girls to talk to us, politics, culture, uh, science, economics, health, what's up? What do you want to see in this program? What do you want Lead Filipino to talk about? What do you need? And the three issues that emerged were mental health. Mental health is a big issue in our community. Whether or not it relates back to civic engagement and how you view that, I would, I would, I would argue that it all links back. Our mental health, keeping mind, body, and soul is one connect back to how we're advocates for our community. So mental health, awareness, education, recognizing signs in a loved one when they need help. Our girls and our women and our mentors and our, and our male um, organizers are saying that's a big deal for our community and it, cr it cuts across all generations. The second issue is the piece about personal and professional development, workforce, um, professional competitiveness, 
uh, salary negotiation, um, interviewing skills. These are all things that the American life demands. The society that we're in, how are we, how are we playing the game to get ahead too? So the third was all around cultural history and identity. So that's our touchstone. Through everything, I think you'll see the theme here inter interwoven. We all care about preserving our traditions, our language, understanding the struggles that led to us getting here and that transcendent story. Our identity and how that plays into it, being first generation 1.5, second generation. We're gonna start in 10 years talking about the third generation Panoys and Panais. And they might have different issues because the California they're coming into, the United States they're being born into, what does the American dream look like for them? A lot of students we're hearing, they're getting their California, UC, CSU, private school education, and they're taking off to Nevada. They're taking off to Texas, Oregon, Washington, because the quality of life there, they can actually put money down and buy a house. So, the question was around civic engagement. How does this all link back and what are we doing? Again, it's really the centerpiece. It's really the touchstone. We take these issues and it's all that personal touch. I keep talking about that personal touch because I could talk and we could all talk to, ad nauseum to a bunch of students, a bunch of um, parents about get civically engaged, go vote, go do all this, run for office, go sit on a nonprofit board. But until it's very individual and it's very subjective, so maybe someone gets involved and wants to run because they see gaps in the current behavioral health system and how services are rolling out to communities. Maybe they get involved because their cousin who they grew up with alongside is a DACA recipient and now can't get a job. Maybe they get involved because they have an uncle or an auntie or someone distant in their family that suffered from mental health and was homeless. So there's always that personal touch that links back to civic engagement, in my opinion. Um, I think, again, I'm going to keep my comment more um, focused very locally on the Soda neighborhoods. And so when we talk about issues impacting youth, uh, I'm going to expand youth to be, you know, actually like children as well. Um, and in the South of the Market, like one of the big issues, there's a school called Betsy Carmichael. Like, yeah. You heard of it? Yeah. It's the, the only Filipino public school that has an education program and a language program in the country. Oh, I'm sorry, second. Long time ago, so thanks for the but at that school, right, and it's uh, a majority of the students are Filipino uh, immigrants as well. Uh, one of the major issues is around housing and homelessness. So about 25% of the students are considered homeless. And maybe not in the sense of, that we think of street homelessness where they're uh, you know, living on the street, but in the sense of living in kind of, um, you know, uh, small cramped quarters with multiple families doubling up. And so we're really trying to engage with the city in working on expanding uh, this classification of homelessness so that these families can get priority listed into the affordable housing system, right? So that's one of the, like, the main issues. Housing is just such a major issue for so many of our young people because it not only impacts them but their entire family. Uh, there's multiple studies about how precarious housing situation impacts all aspects of your life. Um, not just your kind of physical, but your mental and your family dynamics when you have precarious housing. And so for us, this is such a major issue. Um, and again, with a, with a neighborhood, with a community that is really developing at a rate that is uh, extremely fast, but that does not really include our demographic, is extremely troubling. Um, and so, uh, I think in, in terms of how do we engage young people. Um, so some of the Filipinas, we're not really, we're a, more of a program, we're not like a membership organization. But we see what a lot of grassroots and nonprofits are doing on the ground. And, and I want to give a shout out to organizations like South Market Community Action Network. I want to give a shout out to organizations like United Players, um, West Bay, that are really doing great things to engage young people on these issues that are doing great workshops on education to really explain in a way that is um, that you can truly understand of how housing works, how the market works, how the city government works, and how they can insert their voices and their and take action to advocate for their community. And so I, I think those are really it's key to have individuals 
and organizations that have dynamic people that can really break down the issues for folks and create uh, really viable strategies for winning. Um, and I think that's important and, and it's important to have victories. You know, we, we don't want to be Debbie Downers all day and say the sky is falling every other second. We have to show victories that, that even the minor, what may seem like minor accomplishments and successes, we have to highlight those and we have to uplift the people on the ground, the community members, the families, that all collectively threw in their power to get those victories. And we're getting them. And every day we have small victories, even though the sky does look like it's very close to our shoulders and falling, we are winning in many aspects. <coughs> so with my organization, been around for 17 years, so I've seen a lot. Okay? So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna, I'm gonna address it from the imaginative to the, te to the technical, technicalities. So I wanna ask the room here, who here loves shoes? Who loves shoes? Come on, raise your hand. I know you love the Marcos. Come on. It's in our, it's in our DNA. Okay, so a lot of people love shoes, right? I love shoes. And a couple of weeks back, I went to Portland and I bought my first pair of Jordans. Okay, I've never wanted to buy a pair of Jordans because I'm from SoCal. I, I love my Lakers and Magic Johnson. Right? Right. The reason why I ask you all about shoes is that Michael Jordan changed the game on the perception of what a champion looks like. They gave him shoes that was like, yo, when I was a little kid, I saw Michael Jordan, like, you can be like mine. I'm like, holy crap, I can be like mine. You give me those shoes, I can dunk from the free throw line. You give me those shoes, I can put 40 points. It changed the way how people of color in urban, in urban places look at themselves, that they would kill to get those Jordans. So when we flip the script on how we use history as changing the narrative, it is important. When we see ourselves in history books, when we see a teacher that is brown, when we see a Pinai that's a professor, when we see an assemblyman that's up here saying that I am radical and I'm not elected, what you gonna do? That's powerful. So that's the imaginative part. What we do in PEP over the past 17 years, we do three things, three R's, and one of them is not wrong, okay? One of them is that we build relationships from the most little one. My daughter is a fourth grade, 10 years old. She can bust out what Panayism is about. She can bust out what decolonization is about. She can bust out what gentrification is about, and she's 10 years old. That vocabulary was absent for me until I got into graduate school. That's power. That's how you get civically engaged. Relationships. Um, relevancy. How do you how do you be relevant to the people that you're serving, right? So when we talk about my, like the teachers that we serve, I have Emily over here. She's a, one of our pet teachers, and to be relevant, right? We give the, the people the skills to not just do the service learning, but learn the service. You don't have any teachers go into teaching and then they go into teaching. And they're like, I had a good heart. Now f this. Or I was in student activism, now I'm going to this nonprofit, and it's like, I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. Right? You learn the service. You go through it. It's about grit. Right? A lot of times we want the easy way out. One thing I learned, I get, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a millennium, so I'm 39, so I'm the generation Y. Like, why, 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 why? Yeah. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask why. But one thing I learned from my elders is grit. We're not going to get what we want when we graduate. When I graduated in 2000, I thought, boom, I got this degree. Because the narrative was always, Anna, it's not that hard. Get that education. Tell me a job there. Be a nurse. My cousin's right here. They both told us to be nurses. We said, F that, we're going to do our own damn thing. Right? And that's what we did. We got a trailblaze where we've never been before. We're like Star Trek. We gotta be the smart we gotta be the people that we've never been to. We gotta go there. Well, people are gonna be uncomfortable, F it, we're gonna be there. Right? So relevance, responsiveness, know what we the, what our folks need. Right? So when we talk about civically engaged, service learning, we gotta learn the service. It's about grit. Right? And on top of that, it's about swag. 
right? How do you spin your own self with this? My, this is from Kim Davalos, who's my colleague at Skyline College. She talked about swag, right? Your style, how do you enter the room? You know, I forgot what the W is, but A is awareness, right? <laughs> and then you got the G, you gotta be genuine, right? And this is all from my sister Kim, like, and I was like, damn, that is so fresh, right? We can't go into these, the narrative has changed. It's not where it's a merit-based thing where you go in and you get your degrees. I got, a, I got a bachelor's, I started from the bottom. I got a master's, started from the bottom. Got a doctorate, thought I was gonna get a tenure track position. I'm still working at it. You still gotta do, it's, it's rooted in your purpose. And the history of, of our people, we've always been fighting. We've always been fighting, so you're gonna have to fight. Ain't nobody gonna give this to you. You have to fight. So when, when, and that's one thing I learned when I saw my, my family back in the Philippines when I was there at Christmas, I was like, damn, I don't know damn hard work. They know damn hard work. They are planting rice. They are up in there every single day, every morning with their Chanel ass, whatever clothes they want, back, and they make it happen, and they put a smile on their face. So when we graduate, don't expect anything. You gotta work for it. Ain't nobody gonna give you this. This, that receipt, oh my bad, our bachelors, <laughs> you got to open up doors. It's about relationships, it's about, I'm trying to network with everybody here. Because I want to be in places where a brown face has never been. Yeah. Facing for sure in uh, the East Bay, um, there's the rapid gentrification that's that's taking place. There's an affordable housing crisis. We've got young people who may not be able to afford college, but if they do get to college, they are saddled with loans when they graduate, and then have um, moved back to the Bay Area, wanting to live and work here, and can't quite make it out of their parents. Um, um, in addition, we are facing um, mixed status households where we work with immigrant youth who are undocumented themselves or whose parents are, are undocumented. The immigration rights um, situation right now is, is depressing and it really greatly affects the psyche and, and it, it just manifests in this greater political frustration of the moment. Uh, but but we go to where our youth are and, and uh, let them lead in terms of what are the issues that, that um, affect them. So sometimes those are LGBTQ issues, inclusion issues, the policing of black and brown bodies, um, those types of things. But what we do is we first and foremost create the space for young people to be young people, to explore their identities, to be confused and not have to have these answers and feel the pressures from their, their families. We create just kind of a, a very welcoming environment where we do look at um, our identities and, and positive reflections of, of other Filipinos before us that we're able to see. Um, you know, we talk about intergeneral, uh, intergenerational conflicts. We talk about the, the cultural roots of stigma, mental health and community wellness, and how those things are all tied together. So um, in a nutshell, we also provide a political education that's, that's really a tool for empowerment um, for, for our youth. Um, you know, the things that we, we do in, you know, our, our youth meet weekly and, and some of the things that they do throughout the year, we, we do a deep dive on how to run a campaign. We do boot camps on how to uh, register voters, how to go out, collect signatures for to qualify a ballot measure. Um, you know, we have our young people canvassing in neighborhoods and talking to the people who they live and share community with and phone bank with. Shout out to Armin, who's one of our super volunteers out of our Union City office. Uh, office. Oh. He does this. Um, for sure. Super leader. Um, 
you know, we, we engage and empower our youth to the point where they are feeling brave enough to stand in public spaces and speak to elected officials, speak truth to power, share uh, share things that uh, we're not proud of. You know, we're not proud of, of not having enough money or having to do extra to, to make it, you know, to make it to make it by. Um, you know, so those are those are just some of the little things that, that we do that are technical. But our work, our the way that we um, see our youth is it, it's, we work with middle schoolers, we work with high schoolers. The younger our folks are, when they have that spark and they realize, like, look, I am important in this society, my voice matters, my family's history, my people's history matters, that empowerment at that young age, those are the young people who go out there, put themselves out there, and inspire all of us to do what we need to do, which is show up for them, vote. There's many ways to be civic, civically engaged. It really isn't just about voting. Um, you know, Filipinos are great consumers who like Jordans, right? So we can, we, we, we can use um, our consumer power to to really affect decision makers, right? There's all these boycotts that have been going on and, and, and whatnot. We also uh, talk to our public officials. This is, this is a way that, uh, this is a key moment, I think, for, for a lot of us in, in watching and witnessing the youth from the Parkland, from the Parkland youth, and watching them kind of come of age uh, as voters. Like, I'd be damn scared if I, was, if I was an elected official and you know, like, you've got this huge wave. You said 18 to 34 is like 1 million youth. I mean, you know, 34, 0 to 34 is, is even bigger, right? So watch out. These, these young people know, uh, know what they're doing. You know, they know how to organize themselves. They know how to, how to analyze these, these complex social and economic and racial like situations with, with a fresh analysis that, that us older folks have, have kind of been afraid to, to talk about the way that they do, you know? And the power that they have to educate their peers, to educate their families, to educate, you know, their schools and, and really move people. Um, is, is, is just amazing to, to watch. I mean, just watching them on their phones and like doing their little social media thing, you know? I mean, like, <laughs> I'm old. Um, you know, but really, it's because they realize that they are inheriting this mess. And, and they absolutely have the right to, to, to leave with, with that, that type of fire, so. Thank you, Geraldine. So uh, I want to have uh, one audience question. We have time for one audience question. Does anyone have any questions for the panel? Okay, I have a question. Uh, what would be one, um, in one sentence, some final advice for the Philippine American community in the Bay Area? Run on set. Oh, could be a run on sentence. <laughs> Uh, my uh, advice is a little bit more than a sentence, I'm sorry, I'll try to talk fast. But really it's to see our community beyond numbers, beyond, beyond voting propensity. I mean, like I know this is a civic engagement panel, but like I said, our youth and our young people, our undocumented folks, our LPRs who aren't eligible to vote, they are equally invested in this fight. Um, our young people, go to these actions and just go up to people to register them to vote. They themselves are not, they're not, they're not eligible. Um, our caregivers, the caregivers that we work with, most, you know, who, who a good part are undocumented or who don't, uh, who, aren't, who aren't citizens, who aren't registered to vote even though they've been here for 30 years. They're the ones out there leading the fight for, for labor reforms. Um, for, for protections of domestic workers. Uh, so really, to, to not discount ourselves and look at ourselves from just like the very 
um, you know, we're not just numbers. There's people behind these numbers, and, and we are more engaged and more powerful than we believe. I guess my statement will be, each one, teach one. All right? And the reason why I say that is because as Filipinos, we collective people, right? We are a, a barangay, right? It's just, it's just like when we talk about barangay, it's about being in community. We never want to do stuff by ourselves. We have to bring our barangay with us. It's like my one auntie that was scared to do Zumba. And then she saw other people doing Zumba, and now we're doing Zumba every damn family party. <laughs> okay, a movement starts with one person, but it's that each one teach one. We are a barangay, we're a collective. We, we don't do stuff by ourselves. If we have to find believers, we gotta be the example of that belief. Okay, when we see that person up there, we're like, oh, I can be that person? Okay, you roll with me. I'll take you there. Uh, one sentence, here we go. That was it. <laughs> uh, no, uh, my sentence is, um, think, Locally to globally, and all of the systems at play that are crafting your contemporary and your future life. Period. Don't talk about it, be about it. Oh. Education is key. Uh, it's at, our, at the basis of any movement is history, is knowing about it, is caring and being passionate about it. And with young people today, we're passionate, we're angry, we got loans to pay off.